Thanks, Sophie. You're watching Southeast Today, our top story tonight. Jailed for a minimum of 49 years, the Sussex builder sentenced for the murders of Leah Ware and Alexandra Morgan. By a long way, the largest sentence I've ever seen, and I think it shows that the judge is aware of the malice and the ability of Mark Brown. Leah's remains have never been found. Her mother says she'll plead with her daughter's killer to admit what he did. I'll plead with him, I'll beg him. And I'm a proud woman. I'd get on my knees and beg him to tell us where she is. We're at Hove Crown Court with more. A young woman is killed in Surrey, savaged by a dog she was walking. Calls for more teens to have the cervical cancer vaccine as uptake of the jab drops. What it's made from is free and forageable and renewable thing. And a painful project, the dress made of nettles and a film about the Brighton artist who made it. Hello, a Sussex builder who called himself a psychopath with a conscience after murdering two women he'd met through adult escort sites has been sentenced to two life terms and told he'll serve at least 49 years behind bars. Mark Brown murdered Leah Ware from Hastings and Alexandra Morgan from Sissinghurst in 2021. As Piers Hopkirk reports, the judge said Brown had committed depraved acts against vulnerable women. Bleary-eyed and confused, this was the moment justice caught up with double murderer Mark Brown in the early hours in November 2021. I'm arresting you in suspicion of the murder of Alexandra Morgan. Okay? We believe that you were the last person that Alexandra Morgan seemed to be alive with. Police arresting the delivery driver at his St Leonard's home. Now, just over a year later, after being convicted at trial, he's facing a remarkable 49 years in jail for his crimes. By a long way, the largest sentence I've ever seen, and I think it shows that the judge is aware of the malice and the ability of Mark Brown in the crimes that he's committed. I think it's a really important sentence. Brown's first victim was mother of three, Leah Ware from Hastings. A highly vulnerable woman, he kept her at a shipping container on land he rented just outside the town. The judge said he controlled her for his own sexual gratification before killing her and disposing of her body. She's never been found. The family are desperate to find some peace for Leah and to, to give her a burial and be able to say their goodbyes um, and, and their appeal and ours to Mark Brown is really um, to meet with us, do the right thing and, and give us the information that we need so that we can, we can find Leah. Six months after Leah's death, he lured mother of two, Alex Morgan, from Sissinghurst to the farm. CCTV sees her filling up her car for the journey. She wasn't seen alive again. Brown murdered her and burned her body. Sadistic, calculated... Um cunning, sly individual um, who basically lied to everyone he came across in his life. As Nicholas Hilliard sentenced Brown to 49 years for each of the murders to run concurrently, there was sustained cheering and applause from the public gallery. It's clearly a very long time indeed. And there's no suggestion of him coming out uh, after a shorter period. This isn't the sort of sentence where you get half off for good behaviour. He will serve 49 years if he lives that long, and then he will be considered for release, and he'll be released only if he's safe to be released. In a final act of contempt for his victims and their families, Brown refused to attend his sentencing today, but he'll be behind bars now until he's at least 90 years old. Well, let's speak to Piers at Hove Crown Court for us this evening. And Piers, there have been tributes today to the two victims in this case. Yes, Ellie, I think the judge was at pains to ensure that time was given to ensure that both Leah uh, and Alex were remembered by friends and family. And there was very uh, moving testimony from them, both in person and through uh, victim impact statements. Uh, Alex Morgan's parents described her as bright and energetic with a determination to succeed. They said 
She had challenges, but she was overcoming them and had hopes for her future with her two children, who she adored. Uh, there was also a stream of tributes for Leah Ware as well. Her mother described her as kind, intelligent, generous and loving. She said uh, that Brown's refusal uh, to reveal what had happened to Leah was an ongoing torment for the family. She said he continues to extend his sadistic torture of our family's life. Piers, thank you. Well, Leah Ware was 33 when she disappeared, a mother of three who adored her children and was devoted to the animals she cared for, but who'd had issues with drug abuse and poor mental health. Leah's remains have never been found, and this afternoon her mother, Rebecca Martin, told Duncan Kennedy she would plead with Leah's killer to admit what he'd done. She was an angel. I'm, I know it's, um, parents say that was about their children, but... Up until she was 23, I had no trouble with her at all. Messy room, normal teenager things, but nothing, nothing bad at all. Um, and then hit 23 and she was in a settled relationship, a good job, um, and two children. Um, she got involved with a, the wrong crowd and got involved in drugs and all sorts of things I probably didn't know anything about. And the judge was very clear that Mark Brown took advantage. Oh, of her, absolutely. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, her vulnerability. Her vulnerability. Yeah, he did. He did, without a doubt. I find it very, very hard because I'm a Christian and forgiveness is everything. But this has been the hardest thing I cannot forgive. Taking my girl. Taking away the children's mum. Also in your incredibly powerful statement read to the court, you, you, you were clearly sending the message to Mark Brown that he should tell you yes. where he is. Yes. What do you have to say on that? Put him, I wish he would put himself into my shoes if it was one of his children. Would you want your child to be anywhere? No, not laid to rest, not given a place for you to go and visit. You wouldn't. What is the not knowing where she is doing to you and your family? It's hard. He's got to tell us. And I'll do whatever I have to do to get him to tell me. If I have to go and see him face to face, I'll do it. I write letters, which I'm quite in right, my right to do, and I will do that. And I'll plead with him, I'll beg him. And I'm a proud woman. But I'd get on my knees and beg him to tell us where she is. How will you remember her? hard to put all of it into words, really. Um, she was my angel, <laughs> and she always will be. That was Leah Ware's mother, Rebecca Martin, speaking to our reporter, Duncan Kennedy. A 28-year-old woman has died in a dog attack in Surrey. Armed police and paramedics were sent to the scene in Caterham near Red Hill yesterday afternoon but were unable to save her life. The woman was walking dogs when she was attacked. Another woman was taken to hospital with bite injuries but has since been discharged. Well, Peter Whittlesey is live for us in Caterham this evening. Peter, forensic investigations have been taking their place there all day, haven't they? Yeah, in the last few minutes, the remaining officers have left this scene. Earlier, specialist police vehicles were driven off and for, after forensic teams had completed their investigation of the area. This area on top of the Surrey Hills is now open to the public. There is no police cordon. It's a very different scene from how it was earlier today. Close to the public, a large area of the North Downs above Catron was cordoned off as police and forensic teams searched the beauty spot after a woman died following a dog attack yesterday. 
Surrey police are appealing for witnesses and this afternoon the area commander gave an emotional statement. Sadly, despite the best efforts of paramedics, a 28-year-old woman from London was sadly pronounced dead at the scene. The woman is believed to have been walking a number of dogs at the time of the incident. Her next of kin have been informed and will be supported by specialist officers. The police believe the woman was attacked by the dog she was exercising but haven't confirmed she was a professional dog walker. The local MP Claire Coutinho took to social media saying, my thoughts are with the loved ones of the lady who has died, adding thank you to the paramedics for their efforts at the scene. Residents said the Gravelly Hill area is popular with dog walkers. I'm very shocked and surprised. It's a beauty spot, it's a place people go to see the views and walk and run in the hills. It's just a very beautiful walking country viewpoint. You don't hear from it round here, do you? You don't expect it. So, no, just shocked, really. I hope, sad that the lady's passed away. I hope the other one survives. The police have confirmed the woman who was taken to hospital with dog bites has now been discharged and they don't believe she knew the woman who died. To reassure residents, the police have said they are confident all the dogs involved were taken into custody and the investigation is continuing. Well, the borough commander has said this is a tragic incident where a young woman sadly lost her life. She's still appealing for witnesses and says anyone who saw what happened here and hasn't spoken to the police should contact them immediately. The police have also said that all the dogs are in police custody and they've gone on to say that they don't believe any of the dogs are on the banned breed list. Peter, thank you. A 17-year-old boy has been charged with the murder of a woman in East Sussex. The teenager, who can't be named for legal reasons, appeared before Brighton magistrates today and has been remanded in custody. It follows the death of a woman in her 50s in St Leonard's on Wednesday evening. Managers at Gatwick Airport say there's been a significant increase in annual passenger numbers following the end of the UK coronavirus travel restrictions in March last year. 32.8 million travellers passed through the Sussex Airport in 2022. That's a five-fold increase compared to the year before, but it's still only around 70% of pre-pandemic levels. Tributes have been paid to Lisa Marie Presley, who died in California at the age of 54. She left the USA in 2010 to spend six years in the East Sussex village of Rotherfield, even helping out once inside a takeaway van. Customers failed to realise they'd been served by Elvis Presley's only child. A fall in the uptake of the HPV vaccine, which helps to prevent cervical cancer, is worrying health experts across the southeast. Latest figures show the percentage of children coming forward for the jab has fallen in Kent, Sussex and Surrey compared to levels in 2019 before the pandemic. Claire Starr has the details. Rattled but still smiling, grandma and mother of three, Mandy Parker from Dartford, was diagnosed with stage one cervical cancer in 2015. She was 44. What followed was a radical hysterectomy to remove the disease. As soon as you hear that you've got cancer, you're thinking, am I going to die? That, that is what you're thinking. It was horrendous, to be honest, for me, for my family, for everyone around me. And just a real, it's something that lives with you for the rest of your life because you're always worrying, is it going to come back? Mandy's previously raised awareness of the HPV jab. It helps prevent several different types of cancers. It's huge. I think it's a great piece of news that's come out. Speaking um, out when boys were first set to be offered the vaccine in 2019. Research has shown it can reduce rates of cervical cancer by nearly 90%. If you can have a vaccine that protects you against a lot of the high-risk cervical cancers, why wouldn't you have it done? It was really so important for me to have my two girls and my son vaccinated. Basically, getting the HPV jab at this age is when it can be most effective. The but HPV the vaccine is offered to girls and boys aged 12 to 13. Two doses are needed to be fully protected, but its uptake hasn't returned to pre-pandemic levels. Girls have been offered the HPV vaccine since 2008. In 2019, before the pandemic, over 85% of Year 9 schoolgirls had come forward for vaccination in Kent. 
82% in Surrey and 75% in East Sussex. But the latest figures for 2022, as you can see, show those percentages have fallen significantly in all three counties. We had school closures. Those giving the vaccination have been delivering flu vaccinations, COVID vaccinations, and also staff absence themselves. We've also seen a reduced consent rates that's linked in some places to reports of vaccine hesitancy. There are lots and lots of reasons, and that's really worrying. Mandy's cancer was picked up in a routine screening and she's now in the clear. Experts say even if you've had the jab, you should still go for a smear test when offered, with the hope that between screening and vaccination, cervical cancer may be eliminated for future generations. Claire Starr, BBC South East Today in Dartford. Now it's uh, just after a quarter to seven, a reminder of our top story tonight. A Sussex builder who called himself a psychopath with a conscience after murdering two women he'd met through adult escort sites has been sentenced to two life terms in prison. Mark Brown killed Leah Ware from Hastings and Alexandra Morgan from Sissinghurst in 2021. Also in tonight's programme. It felt like I was being transformed by the, by the nettle rather than the other way around. An Extraordinary Labour of Love, the documentary about a dress woven from foraged nettles by a Brighton artist. And today has been dry and bright, but will the rain hold off for the weekend? Well, you can find out with me later on in the programme. Now, he's just 18 years old, but Moses Atoma is already a world youth heavyweight champion and he's being tipped for the top as he prepares for his first ever professional bout. Our sports reporter, James Dunn, is here with more. And James, you've been lucky enough to spend the day with him and also his brother in their gym in Chatham. Yeah, absolutely. And, it, and it's a really nice gym. It's this 18th century building, old, old school, with all this modern boxing equipment and some really, really exciting boxing talent coming through there at the moment. Uh, Moses Atorma is aiming to beat uh, Mike Tyson's record as the youngest heavyweight champion at 20 years old. He started boxing at the age of nine. His brother Carol was the youth Olympic champion and chose to go not to go professional rather than go down the Team GB route. Uh, there's some very exciting prospects coming out of Chatham. Boxing has a brand new combo. The brothers Itorma fighting for the first time on the same bill. Both exciting young prospects, 18-year-old Moses has his first professional bout. I'm excited, but um, also at the same time, the pressure is coming with it. But pressure makes diamond, doesn't it? I've never really struggled with confidence, really. I've um, always been confident in my own ability, but um, yeah, it's going to be good to get out, especially on the big show. 22-year-old Carroll fights for his first international title, which will see him climb up the world rankings. Do you know what? I don't, I don't really take too much notice of it in the sense of, oh, it's a title, it's this, it's that, it's that. Because then when you do that, it's like you're putting additional weight on your back. Um, I try to stay away from everything external apart from boxing. <laughs> Both boxers were youth champions and signed by Frank Warren, the promoter that represents heavyweight superstar Tyson Fury. We've never boxed on the same line, let alone the same place. Their bouts at Wembley Arena were announced this week on the undercard of light heavyweight Artur Baturbiev's world title defence. But how will it feel to fight on the same bill? It's a question I've been asked uh, a few times and my only response to that is I don't know because um, I've never had to kind of have both emotions at the same time where it's either him boxing or either me boxing never at the same time. It's like it's gonna be it's gonna be nuts because we ain't never boxed on the same same show ever so um, yeah it's gonna be one to remember. The brothers fight out of Chatham where they have a host of exciting talents coming through. If you've got people in the gym that are at that level if they can see it in front of them it's all right looking on TV and stuff like that and sort of thinking, oh, I'm going to get there. But when they're actually communicating, looking and actually get the feel for what's happening with these elite fighters, they can actually know their dreams can come true in a way, you know? Their opponents have yet to be announced, but whatever the challenge, these brothers hope they can punch through. Another Kent boxer, Siobhan Clark, has also announced his next opponent. The Graves End fighter will take on Deck Spellman in his toughest fight yet. The winner will get a shot at the English cruiserweight title, but Clark says his focus is on the fight in front of him. I came into boxing uh, 
to, to get fit for football. And I've been to an Olympics, Commonwealth Games, and on the way to become a world champion. So, you know, um, I just give the sport the best I've got and it's rewarded me so far. So I'll continue to do that and um, take the Kent, the Gravesend fans with me. Football now and Brighton and Hove Albion host Liverpool tomorrow afternoon, knowing victory will move them above their illustrious opponents in the Premier League table. Midfielder Alexis McAllister says he still has to pinch himself to believe he's a World Cup winner with Argentina and he's hoping to continue his good form back at the Amex Stadium. An amazing moment. I, in that moment I felt I got emotional and I, I cried a little bit. Uh, but it was it was mad. I I've never th thought about living a moment like this. As for Brighton's women, they have their first match in over a month on Sunday. They're away at Leicester City in what will also be their first match under new coach Jens Scheuer, who took the permanent manager position in December. I'm looking forward for the first away game um, in a big stadium, hopefully in a, in a nice stadium. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a short time. Uh, to, uh, we had a short time to prepare, but um, I think we used it really uh, intensive and really, really good together to 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 let the team know, okay, how we want to play. Crawley Town also play under a new manager in League Two tomorrow. Uh, Scott Lindsay will take charge for the first time at home to Doncaster as he attempts to move his side away from the relegation places. It's our first game, you know, we're at home, which is, uh, it will be great for, for me to uh, manage a team in front of the home fans. Um, it'll be a difficult game, you know, Doncaster are going really well. I've had two days on the training ground with, with the players. Um, but it's a game I'm looking forward to and a, and a game that the players are looking forward to and also, yeah, I'm really, really excited for it. Gillingham are also desperate for three points tomorrow. They haven't won a League Two match since the 1st of October. The Jills are bottom of the table, so hosting the second from bottom side, Hartlepool United tomorrow, really does feel like a must-win match. Although, Ellie, uh, there's some reasons to be cheerful. They've uh, recently signed a striker from the league above, a guy called Timothy Deng from France. So, uh, yeah, I guess the fans will be hoping that they can turn things around. Yeah, good luck to all of our teams in action. A lot of sport tonight, James. Yeah. Thank you very much for all that. Thank you. Now, it's an extraordinary project that Brighton textile artist Alan Brown describes as a true labour of love. For seven years, he foraged local stinging nettles, spinning them into thread that he used to weave and stitch together a dress. Now, a new documentary has been released featuring the nettle dress and Alan's work to complete it while he struggled with bereavement. Chrissy Weedy reports from the Electric Palace in Hastings, where the film is being screened tonight. It's like the history of the last seven years crystallised into this material. Seven summers, seven seasons of nettle, seven winters of spinning. It started as an idle curiosity, he says, that got wildly out of hand. Foraging for stinging nettles, he eventually created hedgerow couture. Yeah, just fiddling around with the, the, the fibre, the bass, the skin of the nettle and scraping away with my finger and I just sort of saw these amazing white fibres that you could scrape down to and they looked good and strong and I just thought, man, it looks like you could make a thread from that and if you could, was it ever done and if so, how was it done? I couldn't find any ready answers so I, I just had to kind of do it myself. But during the journey, his wife Alex lost her battle with bowel cancer and the project became a labour of love involving the whole family. It definitely feels like there's lots of memories and love through this whole thing. Obviously everything with mum, I think me and dad got like much closer and I, I feel quite invested in the whole process so it's nice that I can wear it and be part of it. You might say the film turned into a modern-day fairy tale to the healing power of nature. I call it the stories in the thread, and it's this idea that all your life experience is going into the thread, everything that you're living at that time, it's going into the thread, almost as if, you know, our Neolithic ancestors who did before photography times, they, had, they were somehow putting their life energy into this thread and into this cloth. It's not just about the making, it's about everything that happened during the making. I pray you pay attention and
and quickly the spinning really felt like it was a repository for emotions, uh, grief, memories, the feelings of the day, that somehow the spinning was like recording that into the, into the thread which then found its way into the cloth. So the cloth just felt like it was sort of woven from all those elements. Beautiful and compelling. You can see the nettle dress in Hastings this weekend and next week in Lewis. Chrissy Reedy, BBC South East Today, Hastings. Oh, very moving. Now, time for a look at the weather. Nina Ridge is with us, and it's going to stop raining but start <laughs> snowing. Is that right? Eventually. <laughs> I mean, it is Friday evening, so I feel like the last few weeks we've been talking about rain on a Saturday, and we have got more rain to come tomorrow. But Ellie is right. In the long term, it is going to be turning colder. It felt quite chilly today in the breeze, despite it being dry and bright. We did enjoy some sunshine from our Weather Watcher pictures sent in today. Saturday morning's rain will be with us, all courtesy of this area of low pressure. It is moving its way eastwards, so throughout the afternoon it will gradually turn drier and brighter. Then we're left with quite a blustery day on Sunday, possibly a few showers, but for many of us it will be dry and bright. It's after that that it then gets colder for Monday and Tuesday. So this weekend's forecast still on the unsettled side with that rain on Saturday, brighter on Sunday. So overnight tonight, we'll start off dry with clear spells. The temperature's dropping away, but then it's later on in the night. The cloud will build, the heavy rain will arrive, and I think temperature's starting to pick up. So through the morning, the rain will be with us for a few hours gradually pushing its way eastwards. The afternoon, keeping a little bit of cloud, a few patchy bits of light rain and drizzle, but eventually Western Air is seeing something a little brighter through the afternoon. Temperatures tomorrow still slightly above average at 11 to 12 degrees. Overnight then into Sunday, we are expecting things to be generally dry, bar the odd passing shower. And with clear spells, a chillier start to the day at around four degrees. It's still quite breezy through the day on Sunday. And for many of us, fine and dry with some sunshine. Just can't rule out perhaps one or two showers at times, but they will be very isolated. Now these are our afternoon temperatures, so already you can start to see the signs of that colder air arriving, but it's through Monday and Tuesday that it pushes its way down from the north. Daytime temperatures below average, overnight frost, but by day it does at least bring with it more settled conditions, so it should be dry with some sunshine. So things settling down early, but we have got tomorrow's rain to get out of the way. Dry and cold will take. Thank you very much, <laughs> Nina. That is it from me and the rest of the team for the moment. Linda Hardy will be back with your late news at 10.30. Bye-bye. <laughs>